So, Jonathan, you are um, at Santander and you were in charge or have been in charge of reviewing the entire onboarding process and identifying areas that you could improve and automate it, which is a kind of seemingly quite a large challenge. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you started that process? Sure. So um, the inspiration for the solution we've gone with started at Spotlight with Judo's partnership with Cool Credit. Um, but to diagnose the problem, uh, I went around the country, I sat with front office, I sat with customers, I sat with our back office staff and watched what they did in every boring little detail and just slowly built up this picture of editable PDF forms that in theory are digital when you complete them electronically, immediately losing that digital data capture when they're scanned, when they're wet signed, when they're printed, when they're mailed. Uh, the plethora of forms that cover, cover different products, different entity types that our customers might be sent in a part digitization of the process that had been attempted a couple of years ago meant our Salesforce teams were now retyping that into a digital application that went into somewhat of a robotic process automation, which put some of that data into our core banking platform. And the first thing our back office teams did was check the paper forms that faced the customer with this front office typed up version of it. And they spent 15, 20 minutes of the 90 minutes they're assigned to work on an onboarding case, just checking that those two things were the same. And that created a 50% rework rate that faced the front office, which caused friction between those two teams. And in the meantime, customers getting bored and frustrated. And you might not have gathered all the right information, and you're going back to them. And that takes the time. So I knew that we had to try and capture it digitally. I knew that we had to try and verify it digitally. The partnership between Judo and Call Credit made KYB, KYC possible via API from a new digital form that merged what were 40 disparate onboarding forms into one, made them dynamic, deduplicated all the data entry. But then in the digitization, we also came up with a, a more interesting way of approaching the problem in our back office, in that it enabled us to separate that data entry, that form completion process, from the signature process, which can be quite lengthy in and of itself, because customers have 20, 40 people on a mandate, and you've got to capture all their signatures. So we could separate that by using DocuSign, in the meantime, we've got all the APIs run. We could have that data coming into the bank. And then we could start a robotic process uh, automation, which wasn't just putting a customer name and an address into our core banking systems, but was putting every bit of data in and was deciding the level of automation, the level of verification that had taken place via API, creating different streams of workflow and doing all the product fulfillment activities we needed to do. And that integrated with our legacy systems. And it's changed the customer facing time and that back office process is now a parallel process with the signatures. And it's meant that we can effectively have an invisible back office process in that as soon as you've finished signing, we probably have already finished our work and can ping back to you the account opening details as soon as um, you need them. Trying really hard not to grimace when you were talking about the, the old <laughs> whole processes. 40 forms. Yeah. 40 forms, um, 11 different entity types. They're covering all our transactional banking and, and deposit products. Um, if you were a director and you wanted a credit card, direct debit origination, um, you wanted a corporate card, you wanted to open an account, you were approving the application as a whole, you were signing seven times. So, it's so astonishing. It, interestingly, obviously, that's, you've come from the, the, legacy, the legacy system, and obviously, Tom, you, um, you guys have started from scratch. So, you know, could you tell us a whole different uh, story? Yeah, ours is a bit different to that. <laughs> um, we, we needed to make a decision, I guess, about um, how you could have a, an in efficient onboarding process. And um, for us, the whole experience needs to happen on mobile phone. Um, so it's one thing kind of being mobile first, but when you think about having to enter the information that you want to start a bank account, um, that can be quite hard on a, a mobile. So we've done everything that we can to um, really minimize um, what we needed to capture um, at that, that stage. And I guess one of the key things is that often with um, bank accounts, you'd normally go into the branch. Um, and that's actually something which suits the, um, uh, the bank because they get the opportunity to see you and it's um, therefore kind of lower uh, risk from a, a fraud perspective. Um, in our case, we have no branches, so uh, that's not a, even an option, but also I don't think that's a great experience. Um, but we do need to still have some confidence that the person is who uh, we, we think they are. Um, so we built in something which is a bit unusual. We've got a video selfie. Um, so as part of our um, onboarding flow, uh, you are asked to hold up your mobile phone and say, hi, my name's Tom Foster Carter, and I'd like a Monzo card. Um, and then you take a photo of um, your passport or driving license, um, and that's pretty much it. 
Um, we, otherwise, it's kind of minimal amounts of data capture just around kind of uh, name, address, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that's the, the whole flow. So I guess one of the problems of doing something like that is that it, it can be a little bit, um, I guess it can be a bit of a surprise for some people. The, the moment when you're doing a selfie and just kind of thinking, gosh, this is a, a bank account. Um, but for our customer base, the type of people that we're aiming at who live on mobile phones, um, it makes a lot of sense. And um, it's almost a, a kind of a test, a, a bar to kind of say, is this something you're really comfortable with? Um, if you are, then probably Monzo is the right place for you. If not, then perhaps Monzo at this stage isn't the right place. Yeah, I think um, that minimal data capture is something that I think is you know, moving towards the frictionless journey. And the advantage in the corporate space, and obviously Judeal helps us with this, is that most of the data about the entity is already public, right? We don't need to ask for their address or their name or even how many employees they've got and you know, various other bits of regulation we've got to tick off. And so we pre-populate that from Judeal's API into the customer form. And it means that uh, sort of 30 40% of the fields we're asking for, you're validating the entry rather than filling it out. And it's the same principle as you know, taking the OCR, taking the information from a passport or driving license. And I think that is the difference now that you're not just trying to say, how can we make an elegant form, but how can we get rid of the form and where can we get the data from to do that? And if you've got to have a form, let's make it you know, as pre-populated, as um, automated as possible. So kind of speaking of partners, um, obviously, Josh, you can speak from that perspective of being a partner that you know, is working with yeah, Banks definitely. To... I think um, in, in TransUnion, you've got a, a fairly unique situation in that we have both direct-to-consumer products in terms of things like credit reports, but then also the partnership model where we, and we can fulfill some of the KYC obligations on behalf of the banks or other, lend other types of lenders. Um, I, I think um, for us, especially on the concept of digital transformation, I think that it's, uh, digital's great, but it makes it great for everyone, and that includes bad actors. So I suppose from a fraud perspective, it's interesting because fraud's often considered sort of like the, um, the, handbrake, uh, sorry, the handbrake of a project, so things that are going to add friction, things that are going to add uh, unnecessary weight to, a, to, a, to an onboarding journey. And I think for the way that we've, we've kind of seen success with um, sort of transforming um, onboarding journeys is probably around sort of meeting some level of value proposition. So two kind of sit as business objectives, I suppose, because... You've got to have good customer experience because if you don't have good customer experience, you won't get good customers, therefore you won't have a business. And the secondly is your sort of regulatory compliance element, the things you have to do, otherwise you won't have a business. Then on the, the fraud elements of KYC, it's obviously fraud prevention, but it's doing that in an operational efficient way. So being able to drive a digital journey, which gives you some surety, things like introducing a selfie to help build up the trust where you don't have branch level interactions, Secondly, from an operational perspective, being able to glean some insights around what digital data gives you above and beyond what's traditionally considered as KYC. So I think for where we've seen it deployed successfully, it's, it's more how do you strike the balance between risk and trust. And that will entirely depend on the customer and the type of transaction they're trying to fulfill. If you, and to, to the point on the previous panel, entering your date of birth to buy a book, I mean, it depends what kind of book it is, I suppose. But uh, in, in, in that respect, it, it can, it's unnecessary friction. It's unnecessary data that you need to do that in terms of the risk that those, those types of controls are trying to bring in. Um, Easton, you head up customer success for a customer success company, which means that you are pretty kind of the go-to person on customer success. Um, <laughs> could you, um, you know, could you, yeah, well... Um, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do with your, um, your clients and, yeah. and what, how you actually measure um, customer success? Yeah, sure. Our onboarding for, for Gainsight is much different. So we're onboarding businesses to our software. So, for example, if, if Doodle were to purchase our software, we're ensuring that they're getting the most uh, seamless experience, if you will, um, during the onboarding phase. And, and what that means for us is we really have to change behavior for end users. And uh, there's, there's kind of three kind of top tips I would, I would say that we, we focus on during the onboarding phase. And the first one is onboarding, a, a good onboarding really starts with pre-sales and the sales team. And if the sales team doesn't truly understand the business's needs that we, we are selling into and capture those needs and sets the appropriate expectations, it's just not setting us up for a successful experience. The second is identifying key moments of truth in onboarding. And um, moments of truth for us are where customers are 
investing a lot of time and energy. And that could be a project kickoff call. That could be uh, user accept acceptance testing. That could be the launching of our software. And identifying the key personas that are supposed to be involved in those moments of truth and ensure that we got the right team members from our, from our side to ensure that those moments of truth go, go really well. And then finally, the third, I would say, is to constantly monitor. And we, we look at utilization data of our platform. We look at uh, key milestones going through the onboarding phase and making sure that, they're, that our customers are hitting those. We also look at how they're engaging with our emails, how they're engaging with uh, our meetings, and also if they're completing specific steps in the onboarding cycle, such as uh, you know, training that we offer online or downloading some specific assets that we have. So, I mean, Jonathan and Tom, it's very different for you guys on, on the retail side. Um, how do you guys continually measure um, whether a customer is happy? Like, what does that look like? Um, yeah, sure. So we use a, a few metrics. Um, I guess the thing that we care a lot about is um, organic referrals. So ultimately, how much do people talk about your, your products and recommend it um, to, to other people? Um, so we measure NPS, um, which I think is a kind of imperfect, but um, not a, a bad indicator. Um, and ultimately, the actual referrals themselves, so we have about um, between 80 and 90% of all, all of our growth um, comes from organic referrals at the moment. So if anything um, impacted that, then we would know that we're probably doing something um, wrong at an earlier stage in the journey. Uh, we've introduced CSAT now, so we want to specifically know um, it, both straight after an interaction or for a kind of longer period of time. Um, how people felt about their experience um, with customers. And we measure um, within the first 90 days and kind of segment um, that uh, versus uh, longer term customers, just to know if there's something different about people who've just very recently been through the onboarding journey um, versus later stage. So um, yeah, a few kind of numbers that, uh, that matter to us. One thing that I've been thinking about is capabilities of the team. Um, how do you, if you're looking to, to drive new processes and change internally, um, to what extent do you need, does that need to be reflected in, in the teams that you're building? Um, yeah, happy to, to talk to that. I guess um, it's been easier for us because we were starting from scratch and, and um, that, uh, that obviously is, is an advantage for us having to, to change culture in, in that respect. Um, and on building um, a capability, and where decisions are made, I guess we, we try and do things um, slightly differently. We, um, we use an autonomous team structure, uh, Monzo, which um, I, kinda, I thought that I understood that. Um, but once I've been in that environment, I really get what that, that means. It, it means you've got to almost reinvent um, what it is to, to be a leader in that, that kind of setup. Um, all decisions are taken at, at team level. Um, and there's 100% trust um, and autonomy um, at the kind of ground level to be able to, to do whatever they need to do. Um, to make that work, we've got a level of uh, transparency that I've never really experienced anywhere where else. So um, you could only have an environment where people can make decisions like that um, if they have access to information, um, which any kind of leader of the business would have as well. Um, so we are sort of jaw-droppingly open with um, everything that we have. Uh, the board deck gets sent around the whole company. Um, board minutes are sent out, our executive committee um, uh, minutes, gender, everything is uh, sent, the materials are sent out um, to the whole company, available to the whole company. Um, in fact, we found that having a C-suite meeting um, was not the, uh, the culture that we wanted, so uh, we've invited all the team leads, so we've got about 22 team leads now sit in with the C-suite um, on that meeting um, every week. So, it's a way of doing things quite differently, um, which then means that people feel genuinely um, like they have all the information they need um, and they've got full autonomy. The only other aspect to that that I think really um, is critical is getting the goals right. Because um, if you have got these autonomous teams, um, if you don't set the goals correctly at the start of a quarter or having a good goal setting process, then obviously you've got literally galloping horses and they can head off. And if you haven't clarified, hey, it was uh, you know, Brighton that we're heading to, um, then you're going to have them uh, turn up in Bradford three months later. Um, I think there's um, maybe a bit of debate about where onboarding starts. Um, and I think Justin said before that you only have one opportunity to make a first impression. Um, so how much you know, relationship is there between the brand, the marketing? And I think, Easton, you were talking about this, that 
you know, you're, you guys are known for customer success, so you really have to make sure you know that. Yeah. Uh, for us, it really starts, in, as I was alluding to, in the sales cycle. Um, you know, if, if our sales team isn't, isn't kind of putting the best foot, foot forward for the customer and also our organization, we, we tend to, to have some pretty bad onboarding experiences, right? There's kind of a, a, the right customer fit for each organization. We want to make sure we identify that, and it just sets us up for success. I couldn't agree with that more, and I think it's a great phrase, but um, you literally just get one, one shot at this. So we've got probably 30% um, dropout rate from our, our onboarding. I don't mind sharing that. And so that means that for some reason, 30% um, of people going into our process who are excited about the product don't complete. Um, and I, I think because we're growing like crazy at the moment, it's not, not been something we've, we've focused on a, a lot, but it just makes me think, gosh, it, it, you could just keep on working at that if you wanted to, um, and, uh, and probably should do. I think you've got this opportunity where you set out your stall about uh, what the rest of the products will be like during that journey. Um, so some of the elements of just your tone of voice um, or the, uh, you know, how, how kind of complex you, you make it, um, I think will say a lot about what you'll then do with the rest of the products. It's the same people who are building both your onboarding and other parts of the product, and I think that people will form that impression and then think, great, this is the, uh, you know, definitely a product for me, or actually, no, this isn't, isn't right. Um, so we certainly agonized over kind of getting that, that bit right. Um, I think there's an expression about um, perfection where they sort of say perfection isn't where you um, can't add anything more. It's actually where you can't take anything more away. Um, and I think that that's incredibly appropriate for onboarding as well. It's, it's a process where you just need to work out, okay, what we can minimize, and if there's any scope for moving something to a later stage in the journey, then why not? If you don't actually have to take this particular piece of information, you could ask that two weeks or four weeks later, and that's an opportunity to just make that quicker and get people onto the product's main. And um, you can then kind of get what you need at a, at a later stage. Um, kind of on that note, the, the subject or session title is creating memorable onboarding experiences, and we had this chat before. To what extent do you actually want people to remember your onboarding experience? You know, if, if, if it's if it's memorable, does that imply that it's actually, you know, flawed? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that the only memory I want people to take away from it is that you know the main person who completed the application, and for a corporate, it's a different process, right? We're not in an open uh, application platform. So we've already got a relationship with you and you've decided to onboard as a corporate and we've decided we want to onboard you, uh, which is also a crucial thing in a, in a banking relationship that's normally going to lead to lending as well. But that in that invitation only process, we can curate it for you um, and therefore tailor that application to the conversation that we've had as it's an invitation only process. It doesn't have to be sort of one size fits all. But the only thing I want people to remember is that the person who completed that form was getting the DocuSign update saying, one person on the mandate signed, two people have signed, five people have signed, 10 people have signed, 20 people have signed, and as soon as the last person signs, that immediately they, they get uh, their account details back to them. And the only thing I want them to take away is that it was instantaneous. It's different for us. We, like, this is where you want the magic to start. Um, so I'm just thinking about the, the three businesses that I, I've done, I created a, a card for children. Um, and that, when you're an eight-year-old receiving a it was basically like a bank account for the first time. This is such a magical moment. Um, we actually sent it in a, the way that banks um, had done this in the past was a piece of A4 folded into three and the thing is stuck at the bottom and it's like, here is your bank card. Um, and we had, did it like a birthday card. So it comes in a card and post and open it up and it's, this is your OSPA card and it's just this huge moment. Um, and our biggest problem that we had was so many children would then go and tweet the, uh, the card with their card details. <laughs> We'd have to immediately say, hey, we've canceled your card. <laughs> uh, we'll send you a, another one shortly. Please don't do that again. So um, that's, but that, that magic. Um, the second business we, we had it as a card consolidator. Um, and we sent this in a, um, a magnetic disk in the shape of our logo, which um, slid apart to reveal the, the card. And, um, again, a lot of problem with tweeting it, but we, had a, we designed the, the um, uh, carton this time to cover the card number. Um, but it's just that start of that journey. It's just like, ah, this is amazing. It shouldn't feel like, just because it's a bank product, which could be boring, it shouldn't feel like that. This is still pretty cool. This is still um, actually a, a, a new thing that you signed up for that's um, going to hopefully make your life a, a little bit better. Um, we're trying this, same, same with Bonzo. We've got a, a very distinctive card. It's hot coral. Um, I don't know if people have seen it. Um, 
and it, it's now distinctive enough that uh, apparently it's been used as a chat-up line in bars. So people see the card and say, oh, hey, I'm, uh, I'm also Monzo. How do you find that? Um, which I, I just, I don't know, I can't picture that happening with other banks where it's like, gosh, I'm also Lloyd's GSB and uh, that leading to, uh, leading anywhere. Um, if each of you could, for, for people in the audience who are going through this, uh, creating or building or changing their existing onboarding experience, could each of you share one top tip? I'll go first. No, then. yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way that the head's um, all in. I think, um, I think for, the, for the fraud voices in your project team, they're not always bad news. Um, so... Oh, so <laughs> okay. Well, if anything, I think that there's always two sides of the coin, and yet the, 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 main, the main crux of any services they're going to put in, they, they, their, their team's KPI is always going to be for prevention, but the types of technology that they can bring in can help with your customer segmentation. So I'd encourage everyone to, make, to understand like, the teams that they're engaging with as part of these projects, like what are their KPIs, how can you help them on that journey, and understand how they all, how, allow them to communicate how that can bring value to other areas of that project. I have to say partner with Judo, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much to our fantastic panel and for you guys uh, for listening. I hope they've given you, uh, I'm sure they've given you lots to, to think about. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.